you know, we, we could spend the day just really talking about all the different testimonies that happened this last week as we, as a body, um, spent three days fasting and praying. And I want to first just say thank you to all the ladies who led worship in the prayer room uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. Man, it was really, really powerful, refreshing. It was great having somewhere to go when you're really hungry and worship uh, together with the body. But, man, I think the most common testimony I heard was people just saying, like, I really reconnected with God, or I, I heard God so much more clearly. I heard God say something. I hadn't heard him say something in so long. And I think if, if there was something that would bring joy and pleasure to the heart of God, it would be his people saying that, right? It was, man, I just loved being with God. I loved God talking to me. And, and to be honest, I think that is, is, is the greatest thing that could have happened, um, It was amazing that Ebony, the very first night of the fast, Ebony gave her life to Jesus. And, uh, yeah. Um, And I want to read you guys. uh, Why don't you just just close your eyes. I want to read this verse over you. It really describes um, salvation really well, uh, what David says here in the psalm. I said verse, but verse says, five verses here in Psalm 132. I just want to read it over us that we remember what we have in Christ. Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. But finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Amen? Amen. Um, A few things before we get into the message that I want to uh, share with you. And obviously, Cecily talked about this a minute ago, and... and, um, Today, we are really, and and I hope to do that in the message, we're really wanting to encourage the body, encourage us as followers of Jesus to press into, to dig into community. And so you'll see all the 242 groups that were here before, the leaders that were here before the service, they'll be back at their tables again, and I think there's some goodies and some different things that you can get there at the tables. Um, And so be sure and hang out just for a few minutes after the service and, and walk around and check those out. But secondly, I want to tell you about something that's really, really um, important to us. Um, when we, uh, it's always been on our heart that when we got into our sanctuary, and if you guys don't know, we're in here and we've done it debt-free, which is huge. I mean, for, for, to, for God to be faithful through all these years and get us in here, and we're just now kind of wrapping things up and getting some things finished, but it's always been on our heart that once we got in here, that we would have some type of celebration service just to thank and praise the Lord. And so even though we've been in this room since last January, we're just now finishing everything up, and so we're like, okay, now is the time to have this service. But I'm really glad we've waited because over time, uh, more of what we feel like God wants to do has kind of evolved. And so three things that we really want to happen in this service, and the service is March 17th, so about a month away. Uh, the number one thing is, man, we want to praise the Lord. We want to thank the Lord for his faithfulness. Guys, when I walk around uh, this building and I see what God has done, you know, if we had gotten a loan to do it, I wouldn't have the same feeling that I have now. When I walk around, if, if we had done that, I would have said, look what we did. But when I walk around right now, I say, look what God did. You know, it's a completely different mindset, you know, to to think of it that way, that that God provided. It wasn't some loan that we were having to pay for. And so we definitely want to have a service where we're just praising and thanking the Lord. But secondly, we really want to use this service as an opportunity to invite back um, previous elders and staff specifically who used to be part of Acts, and they are a really big part of our story. So in other words, we wouldn't be where we are it's not just us in this room, but it's also all those brothers and sisters that have been part of our story along the way. And so we've been inviting them back uh, to honor them for their part in the story. And so that's, again, we've, we've been reaching out to them. That's happening March 17th. But thirdly, which is equally as important, we're really using it as an opportunity to 
reach out to those who maybe had visited Acts, who haven't got plugged in somewhere else yet, and invite them to come back. And it's kind of, you know, one of the hardest things about talking to people sometimes is having an end. Like, how do I start a conversation about God? And so this is a great end for us. Like, hey, we just got into our sanctuary. We'd love for you to come back and check it out. Just, just an end to get them in here to encounter the Lord. And the challenge we have for you guys is not only to be here, but it's for you to do the same thing. Like, who do you know that is not plugged into a body of Christ? Either they've walked away maybe from the Lord or they're, or they're just they're, they're searching or maybe they've never encountered the love of Jesus. This is an opportunity for you to say, for like, I just don't know how to invite people. You can say, guys, we're having like this big deal on March 17th where we're celebrating what the Lord has done. Do you want to come with me? So we're handing you guys an easy invitation to invite people back on March 17th. So take advantage of it um, and let's use it. Amen? So with that in mind... Um, because this service, it feels really important. Like, I feel like this is the Lord doing this. I've, I've been working on this sermon or this message for that upcoming service for months. Like, every time I have a thought about it, I'm writing it down, I'm thinking about it. And so I've just I've got this ongoing, you know, pages of, of notes about what I feel like the Lord wants to say. And it also just kind of invite you into my process for sermon prep. On Tuesdays are usually when I kind of finalize sermons. I stay at home. I don't come to the office during that morning. And I just, I kind of bring everything together and try to finish my sermons. And so obviously this first part of this week, we were going through a fast. And on Tuesday, um, I, I did that a little bit, but I was mainly up here praying and things. But, but I kind of had a sermon ready. But on Thursday morning at the end of the fast, I felt like the Lord said, that message you planned for March 17th, I want you to preach it now. And it feels really strange for me because I feel like he said, you can preach it again on March 17th. You're going to preach it twice. And I go, that, that feels funny, you know, doing that. But I really feel like that's what he's saying. So that's what we're going to do this morning. Okay? So let's pray. Um, God, you are amazing. Thank you for your faithfulness, your love. And I love what Brandon said, Lord. We want to move beyond relationship of just knowing you into deep fellowship with you. But God, how beautiful it is when we not only have fellowship with you as an individual, but when we, when we dig into deep fellowship with one another, and then towards you, God, we, we worship and we grow and we seek your face. Lord, so have your way this morning as we dig into your word. Bless it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So I'm not, I'm not going to do the whole message, but kind of parts of it. And so it, it kind of starts like this. Um, when we really started planning a service several months ago, I felt like the Lord asked me a question. And the question was, David, if you had to do things over, I was really reflecting on the journey. David, if you had to do things over, what would you have done differently? And if the Lord asked me that question, it's quite a long list, right, of all the different things that I would have done differently. And then I, I felt like he kind of clarified it. And he said, I want you to ask me what you should have done differently. And so I said, okay, Lord, you know, in, in your eyes, what should I have done differently? And so I, I've written down exactly what I feel like he told me, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read it to you. He said, David, he doesn't call me Booker, he calls me David. <laughs> David, if you could do it over, I would want you to enjoy the journey. You see, most people think of me only as the God of the destination the God of the achieved goal, the God that helps them accomplish something. But I am also God of the journey. And so when he said that, I mean, I, I feel like I knew what he was saying, but I've, I've spent months kind of digging into that. And what I, what I believe he was saying to me is that um, we tend to recognize God most. Uh, we, we tend to recognize God showing up. We tend to recognize his presence. We tend to recognize um, him most when something is accomplished. Like we did something, we, we got in here, look, look what God's done. But God is really wanting us to learn, or at least he's wanting me to learn, to recognize him throughout the journey. Like I am the God of the destination, but I am also equally God of the journey. Psalm 32, 8 says, I will guide you, this is the Lord speaking, I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. I will advise you and watch over you. I love that. It has nothing really to do about a destination. It has to do about walking with God. He's like, man, I want to walk with you. And there might be someone, if you're walking, you're heading somewhere. And even though you're heading there, that's not just to get to that one point and say, man, look, God showed up. But he's saying, I want you to recognize me along the journey. 
Um, you see, in our culture, we are really super programmed to be goal-driven and destination-driven, right? Like we, we measure success on did we get to that place that we were trying to get to. But God defines success differently. You see, you can achieve a goal and not succeed. You can get to the end result. Like you can have something in mind you're trying to get to, and you can get there and actually like accomplish that thing and, actually, and, and fail in a sense, like not doing it maybe the way that God intended. You see, God defines success differently. And I think we, could, we, we want to sum it up, especially with what I'm talking about this morning. Um, did we know and did we enjoy the journey to get there? When uh, if you've ever ridden somewhere with me, I apologize. I am trying to change. I really am. I'm working on it. Um, and I can't help it. I can't help it. I want to say that. This is my natural flesh. This is what I do. If I'm going to go somewhere, especially on a trip, I punch it into the GPS, and I see what time I'm supposed to be, th be there. And if I don't beat it, I failed. <laughs> that, I mean... And if you have to go to the bathroom on the way, you ruined the whole trip. That's how I view it. Like, we don't have time. You need to hold it. You need to figure it out. Because we have a mission and a goal that we're trying to accomplish. Anybody else needs to be honest this morning? Okay. Um, but the problem with that is there's all kinds of cool places to stop and see along the way. And if we're just so focused on where we're trying to get and we don't enjoy the journey, we're missing out on the, the biggest portion of our life. If God wants us to enjoy the journey, what exactly does that look like? And so these are the questions I've been asking him. And so I'm trying to make it really practical. I'm asking the Lord, so God, what is it? Is it just slowing down? I mean, I'm sorry, some of you guys are slow and don't accomplish anything. That's not what we're talking about. We still want to accomplish something, but is it just slowing down or is it something else? And I believe there's two things that the Lord told me. He said, if you can learn to enjoy these two things, then that's what I'm talking about. If you, if you can get this, that is what, what I mean. Like, I'm God of the journey. If you, it's just not about where you go, but it's about, it's about the, the journey to get there and, to, and enjoying it. Guys, you know that God talks about in Scripture over 400 times that he wants us to enjoy life. Over 400 times. He must mean it. So these two things are pretty simple. Number one, it's him. He wants us to learn to enjoy him, being in fellowship with him, not just seeing God as a means to an end, not just seeing God as the one that's going to help me get there, but enjoying God while you're going there. And the second one, which is the one we're going to spend most of our time on this morning, is God wants us to enjoy people. God wants us to enjoy people. Well, if we're being honest, people may be where some of our biggest frustrations are. But God wants us to enjoy people. And we'll, I think this will make a lot of sense by the end. Jesus addressed these, these two things in Matthew chapter 22. He says, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered themselves together. One of them, a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and foremost commandment. And then, of course, Jesus says these famous words, the second's like it. It's very similar you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then he makes this profound statement, on these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. That means your Bible can be summed up with those two things. That's the law and the prophets. Everything can be summed up in your life if you learn to love God and love people. You've got it. That's the journey. God wants us to love him and love people. And if we do this, if we, if we get this, if we figure it out, if we ask him for the grace for it, we will enjoy the journey that we're on of life, and it won't just be about the destination. 
You see, it's possible to achieve your goals and be in denial about your love for God and for people. It's possible to acquire lots of Bible knowledge and to be unhitched from producing fruit in your life and loving people well. Because Bible knowledge without love is just self-righteousness. It's possible to be a provider, men, for your family and yet not be a husband or a father. It's possible to be a woman who sees her kids or has her kids involved in everything and dedicates her life to their achievements and not be a mom or a mother. Do you guys get what I'm saying? We can be so focused on the things that we want to accomplish in our life, even in our family, in our homes, and we're trying to go somewhere, then we're not even doing the most basic thing of loving our families. It's the man that works so hard to save for retirement and doesn't know how to enjoy his family and they suffer because of it. It's the mother that creates unhealthy standards and goals for her children and makes them miserable in the process. It's the person who's hyper-focused on what others are doing wrong instead of learning to love people. You can be moving towards and even achieving the goal, but if you don't love God and love people, Jesus and Paul end up teaching it doesn't matter. If we don't have love, it doesn't matter. Years ago, I think I've only had, uh, and some of you that, that, some of you heard me tell this before, but I don't usually feel like I have um, spiritual dreams, prophetic dreams, and I can really think of two that I've ever had in my life. Uh, One was very recently, and the other was, 10 or 15 years ago, and, and the dream went like this. I remember it very clearly. I was driving a boat on the Brazos River, and it's not really wide, you know. Anyway, we're having some kind of church function out there, and everyone like in the church was on an inner tube and just enjoying themselves and floating on the river. So you kind of get the idea. Everybody's just kind of floating, having a good time, and I'm in a boat, a boat, and I'm going like 60 miles an hour. And I'm just flying down the river, and I'm being careful not to run over people but you just can't help like I'm knocking them off of the tubes. And I'm literally like going, sorry, and just keep going. And I knew, I mean, like inside I felt a little bad, but it was kind of like, I'm driving fast, and you just need to get a bigger tube or something. Um, And I woke up from the dream, and I knew immediately, I was like, Lord, that was a really weird dream, and it felt like it meant something. What did it mean? He was basically telling me what I'm talking about right now. He's like, man, you... You're so focused on what you're trying to do. You're, you're, not, you're just knocking people off and, and hurting people. And you think that where you're trying to go matters more than the people that are trying to enjoy being in the church. That was a pretty good rebuke from the Lord, right? My prayers uh, have been changing recently. Guys, I, am, you know, I feel like I owe you an apology because you guys have a pastor that has a ton of growing to do still. I mean, I think, I mean, everyone has some growing to do, but I have probably more than most. Um, You know, I still pray about goals and dreams, and I think they're important to pray about. If God deposits something in you that that you want to accomplish, that you feel like it's a God dream inside of you, I think you should pray about it. I'm not saying don't pray about it, but... I don't think that should be our primary prayers. And for me, at least, like, my primary prayers have been changing. It's not so much, even though I do pray, like, God, man, I feel like you want to do this. Let's go do it. My main prayer is becoming, God, help me to love people. Help me to be encouraging. Help me to lay down my life. Help me to serve people. Guys, I used to think this. I used to say this. Um, I don't care about being a pastor. I just want to be a leader. And it took me years to realize I'll never be a leader if I don't learn to be a pastor. Like it's people that matter more than the destination even. And we hear and we're taught all kinds of things out there like, no, what matters is you go and you accomplish this thing and you do this thing. And God, I believe, is saying something different. He goes like, I I can do that. Let's go for it. But man, if you don't love people along the way, that's not what I was going for ever. We need to learn to be more driven by love than we are our destination. 
If you want to know God as the, journey, as the, as the God of the journey, then it, it is paramount, it is necessary, it is incumbent upon us that we figure out, like, if we're going to enjoy and know God in the journey, and not just about where we're going, then we've got to figure out, what does God need to do in me so that I love people? What not enjoying the journey looks like is we don't walk in freedom. When you're not enjoying the journey that you're on, and so if you're thinking in your life right now, like, man, I'm trying to be faithful, I'm trying to serve the Lord, I'm trying to do something, but I am just not enjoying this journey, it usually looks like this. We're not walking in personal freedom. We're hurting people along the way. We value being right over being in relationship. It's kind of a common phrase we say around here quite a bit. I'll say it again because I, I think it needs, it needs to sting a little if, if it's us. In our homes, in our family, in our relationships, people at church, do you value being right over being in relationship? Because we are so destination driven, are we willing to run over people to get where we want to go? Whereas our priority is I want to go there, but I want to take as many people as I can take with me. We've been reading John 10, 10 every week, and let me read it to you again. It says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundant. It doesn't say that I came that they may have and end up at a great destination, does it? It says that you may have life, talking about as you are living your life. The abundance isn't about if I just get there, that's the abundance. The abundance is meant to be the life you're living right now. What's happening in our life, in your life, in my life right now is meant to be abundant, over, overcome with the joy of the Lord inside of us. That's not to say that we don't have trials and tribulations and, and things that happen. But what's crazy, it tells us that joy in Scripture is not, has nothing to do with, with our trials or tribulations. It is a fruit of the Spirit. It is something the Spirit of God is working out in us. When there is an imbalance in the destination focus and the journey focus, we are not only hurting ourselves, but we're hurting people, and we are actually living unstable lives. John 13, 34, Jesus says, a new commandment I give you. Now, if we heard Jesus saying this, if we were there 2,000 years ago, and we heard Jesus saying, I'm fixing to give you a new commandment, you'd probably be on the edge of your seat. You should be thinking, what is this going to be? I think it'd probably be something like Jesus saying, you're supposed to love Jesus the most. Like, or something about Jesus, right? Something, like, I'm going to give you a new commandment, and it has to do with me, but that's not what he says. <clears throat> I'm going to give you a new commandment. And the word new here doesn't mean like you've never heard it. It means I want you to hear it in a fresh way. I want you to do it the way I'm doing it, is what he's saying. The new commandment is that you love one another, even as I have loved you. So it's not just that you love one another, it's that you love people the way that Jesus loves you. By this, all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Man, what, what did he just say? The world, the unbelievers, those that are lost, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, uh, pagan, people that just have no idea about Jesus, how they'll figure out and be drawn to Jesus, how they'll, how they'll know that we're followers, not that we're, we have some labels that says Christian, how they know that we're followers of Jesus is by how we radically love one another. In other words, you're going to love each other different than anyone else loves anybody else. The way that I love you. Out of all the things he could have said here, it didn't say by power, by works, by, he said, they will know you by your love for another. And so the question becomes, is like, if people come into the church, is that what they feel and sense? Do they come in and they're like, man, like that is different. I think they are serious about following Jesus because they treat each other that way. Jesus would mark us as his disciples by how we love one another. We can mark ourselves as his disciples by the way we love one another. The world can mark us as his disciples by the way that we love one another. And loving people and, and, and putting people first goes against common sense. It goes against 
how we think about everything, let me give you a good example. Laren Silver, back here, works at a, at a company, a pallet company. And everywhere that this, this company, I don't know how many locations they have, Laren, how many? 40? And every location that this pallet company has, they hire a chaplain, which Laren is one of those, to be on staff to minister to the people that work there. I bet the first time they handed their books to their accountant, the accountant was like, this is stupid. Like, why would you do this? This doesn't make any sense. Why would you spend money? This doesn't matter. I think that's a really good picture of this. Like, man, we're going to love people even if it costs us something. So let me transition to what I'm supposed to be doing this morning. And that is um, promoting and encouraging you guys to be connected here at the church, to be in fellowship with one another. Um, So let's recap a minute. Um, If what matters most to God in our journey with him is to be in relationship with him and people, then isn't being intentional about deep relationships essential? In other words, if you're sitting out there and you're hearing what I'm saying and you're like, oh yeah, of course, I love God and love people, that's right and you don't intentionally dive into deep relationships, then you don't really believe what I'm saying. You can't believe what I'm saying and and stay in the background. Like, there's no, you haven't engaged, right? If you believe what I'm saying, if you believe that it's true, then the first step is to engage in relationships with people. How can we be known by our love for one another And he's talking about brothers and sisters in Christ unless we invest in relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ. I mean, how could the world even recognize that we love one another if we are not deeply involved in each other's lives? Like, that has to be the starting place. You see, we can live with regret that we would have done things different. But God has never wanted us to live with regret. He He wants us to repent and change. He wants us to respond to his word and and say, okay, I think this is right, and and I'm a little uncomfortable about this, but but I'm going to do it. Guys, if you haven't heard this, let me tell you, I believe this thing is true. Obviously not in the Bible. Um, In the 1940s, two things happened in America that they say killed uh, community, killed uh, people being in relationships. Um, If you think that that we're kind of how, how the way America is right now about relationships, if if you think that's the way it's always been, you're wrong. In the 1940s, two things happened. One is homes started getting air conditioning. And the second thing that happened about the same time is people started building garages on their homes. Because before air conditioning, especially here in the South, what would happen is everyone would go home to their homes and it was too hot inside, so everyone in the neighborhood sat on their porch. And everyone was outside and everyone knew their neighbors. Everyone knew not just their neighbor across the street and next door, but around the block and two blocks away. But what happened with air conditioning is everybody went back inside. The television, you could throw televisions in there as well. And then garage, what happened with the garage? It used to at least you could pull up at your house and wave hello to the guy who's sitting outside at his house. But now you push a button, open your garage, drive in, the garage door closed, you go into your air conditioner house, turn on the TV, and the next thing you know, a year's passed, you haven't seen your neighbor. You have to be intentional today about meeting the people around you. And when it comes to the body of Christ, you've got to realize that that what we've described many times is this is just the way I'm wired isn't a valid excuse. Not all of it's the way you're wired. A lot of it is the way you've been raised. And it's what's comfortable and it's what's easy. Because the truth is God has wired us for fellowship with one another. I'm not saying that for some it's not easier than others, or some it's more difficult than others, but the truth is when you became born again and the Spirit of God came and lived inside of you, he wired you for fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ. Again, we could live with regret of saying, oh, I wish I could have done this, or, or wishing I was made different or wired different, or we could repent. Guys, 242 groups, you know, we... we I'll read the scripture here in a minute. Um, 
They are not some slick ministry tool or thing that we're trying to use. They're, they're an opportunity for you to do and try to live out what I'm saying. Like if you're finding it hard to, to live in relationship and fellowship with brothers and sisters in Christ, and let me go back and say what I really, according to the word of God, I believe living in relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ is paramount to enjoying the journey of life. Now, I'm gonna, I know a lot of you are thinking like, I've been in relationship with Christians and it ain't a joy at all. trying to change that. So I want you to think for a moment about if you've ever done this, you know, different churches have cell groups, life groups, 242 groups, whatever. And the process of going out and trying a group and what we say after we try a group. So in other words, we go and we visit a group and we leave and we're talking with our friends or our spouse or whoever and we're like, eh, I didn't really like the way they taught. It wasn't very good. It wasn't very deep. Kind of boring. Or maybe that was good. I didn't like the way they worship. I mean, I know they didn't have a, a play, person playing guitar, but they put it on a TV, but they didn't pick the right songs, and I didn't like it. I want you to think for a moment if Jesus was trying out 242 groups. And he went, and when Peter showed up at a group, and he's walking afterwards, and he looks at Peter, and he's like, yeah, I went to Bonita's group. That wasn't very good. I didn't like that book study she was doing. Let's go find another one. I went to Sam's group, and, you know, they meet at the pizza place. I don't really like pizza. So I'm just not going to go there anymore. You see, the joy for Jesus would not have been the pizza, the worship, or the word. The joy for Jesus would have been the people. And for him, it wouldn't have been, people are different. Some of you guys are different, right? People, I mean, I'm normal. Some of you guys... <laughs> People are different. Jesus doesn't leave like, yeah, they're just a little different. I'm not going to that one. No, Jesus would have left like, Peter, that was amazing. Because in this place, like, I got to hear their hearts, and I got to pour up my heart. And Jesus would have never have gone with, what can I get out of it? Whether we like it or not, we live in a, in a Christian world that it is so, consu we, we are all guilty of it. It is so consumer focused. It is so, what will I get out of it? Or do you, did you go and you think like, man, what can I give? What can I give? Maybe the reason the problem wasn't the worship, wasn't the pizza, wasn't the Bible study. Maybe the problem is your heart. Because you went with, to it with the mindset of, if, if I've got, a, I've got some, some boxes that I'm going to check, and if it doesn't check all the boxes, I'm going to try something different. Jesus, I believe, could have gone to any 242 group and loved it. Because people are there. And to him, I think, by, by everything that he did and leaving his throne in heaven and coming to the earth to spend all the time that he could with people. We don't want you to get connected and go to a, a, a 242 group because it's a promotion, because it's a ministry. Well, let me, maybe sometimes we do. Maybe we get off track sometimes, like, oh, we just got to do this. Or that. But the truth is, when we get down to the nitty-gritty, we get down to the Word of God, the truth is, I believe what the Word of God says is true. And I don't want to get to 10 years down the road and achieve some goal and to be asking the Lord, God, what should I have done different? And he has to tell me the exact same thing again. He has to tell me, you know what? I wish you would have learned to enjoy the journey. I want to receive what God has for me now, the abundant life that he has. And I believe, guys, it is completely wrapped up in him and in people. 
People are messy, right? All of us. The person beside you right now is messy. Knowing all this, God still teaches and says what he says. It is the person that's willing to to dig into that stuff and to love people in their messiness, to love people in their hurt, to love people in their trials. Those are the people that that are figuring out the life that God has for them. If we're a little shy, you don't have to repent for being shy, but it's something you can, you can lay at the altar of God and say, God, I'm a little shy, but I'm going to ask for some boldness. We could end it by saying it's not about you. If we can get down to it, what Jesus says, it's always about him and about others. I mentioned that um, the idea of, of, of trying to get in our heads that we gather with the body of Christ to, to give. That's the, that's the image and the picture that God painted for us. And if we, if we don't get with people and give, then people are going to miss out on God loving them through us, and it matters. So with that said, I have a testimony for you guys, and I don't, I think she's sitting back here. Joanna Duncan, let's give it up for Joanna. Joanna, come on up here. Where are you going? You go right here. All right, so if you've been here at Acts for, for any amount of time, you probably know Joanna. And just uh, almost two years ago, we're getting pretty close, um, her amazing husband, John, passed away. Um, Joanna and John knew, know what it means to live a life invested in community. And they have community. And what I want her to share with you is I want you to get The idea is of what if she had to go through what she went through without fellowship with people? Good morning, church. Hello, hello. There you are. Good morning, church. Um, The word community. What does that mean to you all? It can mean a a, a, a number of different things, but to me... It means that we're not necessarily all related by blood, but we're all related by the blood of Jesus Christ. So it's been, as you said, it's been almost two years. And it's been quite quite a ride. And uh, it's been the hardest thing I've ever done in my entire life. I never would have thought it. Okay. Um, but the fact is, um, community is important. It's, it's vital. It's a lifeline, really. Um, all you guys are an uh, amazing part of my life. Um, when John had his... his treatments that he was having to go to MD Anderson. There was a time when I was sick and I couldn't go. And um, Dean Lesman went with him. And it was a few days. It was like a three-day treatment, but he went with him and I couldn't go. That was important. Um, as far as, as when I had my hip surgery, you guys loved on me well. You know, brought us, brought me some meals and also came in and even cleaned my house. And you didn't have to do that, but you did. Um, and then when John took his last breath, you guys have been there. I woke her up. I just want to say I thank you. That's how important. It's, uh, it's 
it's just one of those things, man, that, that sometimes you just overlook. But please don't, guys. If you are not plugged in somewhere, I'm just saying. You guys have loved me well. You've loved John well. And you continue to love me well. And I want to thank you for that. So, just thank you. And I love you all. Take a minute. So the, I think she painted the picture perfectly. So you're sitting here thinking about, man, does it matter that I'm in community? Does it matter that I'm in fellowship? And let's take what we're talking about today, specifically in our 242 groups. Does it matter? Is it all about just what I can go get out of it? Or does it matter that people are there that need to be loved on by God through me? And that's why I go. It is, it is complete mind shift that needs to happen of us laying down our lives and like it is not about me it's about other people and it is in doing that in fact jesus like he goes out of his way to try to communicate this to like you who lose your life are the ones who are going to find it if you try to save your life if you try to protect your life and say oh, i always want to live here and i don't want to do this and i don't want to get in other people's lives i don't want it to get messy he said you're not going to find it it is he who's willing to lose his life that finds it. And so, I hope you guys get the picture. To be a follower of Jesus is to, is to relinquish and say, it's not about me, it's about me living out the word of God. And I go do this because God says it, and I trust him. And if I do it, I'm going to find life. When I find life, people get blessed. And all of a sudden, I look at my journey of life. My journey of life is one that... I feel like this is abundant. I have a feeling when Dean was with John getting his chemo at MD Anderson that, that Dean wasn't, it wasn't like a begrudging, like, oh, I wish I wouldn't do that. But the life that came from being able to love John in that place when Joanna couldn't go. Well, Chuck, and you've got email too, and I haven't had a chance to see it, but he's calling me to say thank you for your service. The life of God, what he's inviting us into. Take advantage of it. Let me read to you. I'm going to close with this verse. Acts 2.42. This is the verse we named our church after. And this is what we, what we call our, uh, our groups, 242 groups. It says, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. I want you to notice that all four of those things have to do with community. We together are learning together the apostles' teaching. That's what it's talking about. It's not talking about individually. Like, it is individual Bible study is good and right, but here it's talking about fellowship. And they were devoted to it. They were devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to it. What are you devoted to? Whatever you're most devoted to in your life, sub that out for a minute and say, that's how I want to be devoted to fellowship. They were devoted to breaking of bread. Again, that's the community piece of it. And they were devoted to prayer. This reference is not talking about individual prayer. It's saying they were devoted to praying together. This is the life of God that he's calling us into. And this is how we know him as the God of the journey. Today, I, I hope it's a, a catalyst for you. I hope it's a, it moves you. It, it causes you to embrace like, yeah, this may be a little hard for me, but I think this is what God's saying, and I'm going to do it. So I want you to bow your heads, and we're going to pray. I'm sorry, altar team, not going to have you guys come up, because after I pray, we're going to dismiss uh, everyone in here just to go kind of make your ways around, uh, introduce yourself, and 242 group leaders, introduce yourself to people, and see if you can't get connected with someone, and start down this spiritual journey, not just a, it's not just a, a, a church program or ministry. God, I thank you for, first of all, Joanna. I just ask your continued blessing and healing upon her heart and on her mind. And I thank you, God, that you not only heal her, but you actually use people to help do it. And God, I just pray for everyone in here, Lord, that we would not have the experience of going through things that are really difficult and going through them alone. Because we did not invest in what you were inviting us into. Holy Spirit, do a work in this church, in this body, where we really 
lay down our lives for one another. We, we really put others' needs above our own. And we experience you. Lord, we bless you. We love you. And we say these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you, why don't you guys stand up? Thank you, Joanna. Um, 242 Group.